Welcome to Still Growing in Grace, a program dedicated to inspiring joy, giving hope, and delighting in grace. I'm Mike Zenker, and I'll be sharing with you a message of hope that will expand your understanding of God's love and amazing grace. God already deeply loves you, totally accepts you, and really, really likes you. Growing in Grace Ministries Canada and Hope Fellowship, your community church, invite you to enjoy today's program as we dig deeper into what it means to be still growing in grace. Well, good morning and welcome to Still Growing in Grace on this Wednesday morning. Uh, thrilled you can take time to be with me today, today this last week of December. Uh, today's December 28th, and this will be the last broadcast for 2022. And I look forward to 2023, hoping to see, well, let's just say a fresh lineup of content. And I've uh, been mulling and, and pondering uh, topics and people to uh, interview um, and uh, I think I think it's going to be an amazing year. Uh, for those who have uh, valued what we do and enjoy these conversations, um, if you uh, if this does bless you, would you consider doing a year end donation? I don't talk about this much. I really don't. So if you know any of my stuff. I hate talking about this, but we're at year end and we'd love to end the year well and start the new year better. Um, so all the financial support that uh, comes in would really make uh, our, our start for 2023 a whole lot better, uh, and a little more stable. Um, we don't ask for a lot, um, but any donation uh, would make a big difference. And for those of you that don't like me talking about money, I'm really sorry. Um, but uh, that's kind of how things go i always say the gospel's free but getting it out is not and so yeah i'd value that uh, it would mean a lot to me too all right let's dig into our stuff today um i have a an, a fine what a way to end the year we're having a final uh, um retake or a um resharing uh one video from the forgiveness conference we had last at the beginning of 2022 um, that I think was really, really powerful. My friend Paul Anderson Walsh uh, in England from the UK um, is a profound thinker and speaker. Um, I love his content. I love his heart. Um, he's been to my church a couple times. He's done conferences here in our area. Uh, he, some of you know who he is. Um, if you've not been treated to hearing him share, I think this is going to be a delight. What a way to go out this year for our final broadcast. Um, I've not re-listened to it since the last time, so I'm expecting it to be amazing because I know it was. Um, so I'm listening live with you. So if you're watching, uh, comment and tell me where you're watching from, and I'll interact with you on the uh, chat as well as uh, I'll come back on at the end. I hope you'll enjoy this. I think it's like 45 minutes long, uh, so just a heads up. It's not one of the shorter ones. Um, but I think I think this perspective is going to really help those that are are trying to understand how does forgiveness work because the topic of forgiveness is part of the deconstruction menu. It really is, um, and it has to be addressed. But it needed to be addressed long before deconstruction uh, became a thing in our pop culture. Um, and that's again that's for another topic. And I'm going to bring Brad Jerzak on in the new year to talk about his new book, Out of the Embers, and talk about the great deconstruction, what that looks like, dispel some of the myths of it. If you haven't uh, read his book, go get it. Um, let me. In fact, I think I do. I have it on here. I do. Here we go. Let me just uh, throw that on there. I think you're gonna. This is the book um, by Bradley Jerzak. Get it. Uh, I'm listening to the audio book now, uh, and I think you're gonna really love it. So. Uh, anyway, worth considering if you're if this topic is of interest. Um, but let's do that with forgiveness. So let's get into this conversation um, with Paul Anderson Walsh. Enjoy. Here we go. All right, this is so much fun. I am thrilled to introduce you to Paul Anderson Walsh. Uh, I've had the privilege of knowing him for many, many years. He's spoken at my church several times, and we have loved his presence. So. Uh, it's an honor to have you in England right now, uh, joining in, and uh, uh, I've, I've asked Paul to talk to, with me about the topic of forgiveness and where he's at now, because Paul's spoken into my life from many different lenses in, in the journey of grace, but this topic is a biggie. So say hello, Paul. Tell us where you live, what you're doing right now. 
Mike, hello, it's so good to be with you. I tell you, it feels like I was just trying to, when you were chatting there, I was just trying to do the math and thinking, when was the last time we were together? I think maybe when it was, uh, I came and did the Made to be Free conference for you in- uh, Yeah, at Lincoln Road Chapel, I yep. I don't know when, I don't know, but yep. a, long, a long time ago. I'm so thrilled to be with you. So thank you for thinking of me as one of the guests to invite into this conversation. Um, I'm based in London, England. Um, I have for many years been uh, in this conversation around grace. We've had a, a community called the Grace Project for a number of years. We have a thing called the Grace at Home community, which is our kind of was, was our, is our pandemic, pandemic offering. Um, and I'm also the chief executive of an organization called the Center for Inclusive Leadership. So forgive me, I'm still at work, which is why you can see the- I like the logo. <laughs> why you see the logo. And, uh, and interestingly, I, I found like one of the things I'm sure that will come Kind of talk to as we go along in our conversation today is I'm seeing a really interesting connection between um, what I was very much involved in in the pastoral world where I was thinking about that whole issue of of grace and of you know of course the notion of forgiveness I would very early on started talking very much about the notion of inclusion and wanting to be talking to much more about the inclusive nature of God's love mm. and interestingly I think there's been a there's been a there was, I had a moment actually, and it was it was intriguing because at the end of 2020, I resigned from the NGOs that I was leading. So we stepped down from the leading leading our church. Uh, we stepped down from leading the uh, social justice project that I was involved in, and stepped down also from um, leading one of the uh, organisations I was working with for helping other leaders of of, of, of NGOs. Uh, and I did that because I wanted to put my energy really into the whole idea of inclusion in the workplace, workplace inclusion. And what I hadn't realized at the time was that there was an interesting overlap between these three conversations that I was having. So in the church conversation, I was having a conversation about, uh, about uh, oneness, unity of oneness, spiritual freedom, release from all of the stuff that no doubt we'll talk about today. My social justice work was about liberation and my other work was about helping people flourish as leaders. And it suddenly occurred to me that really the work I'm doing in the inclusive leadership space is not really so much a corporate endeavor, although we, you know, we have some of the biggest corporate names in the world, but it's really about bringing the message of hope and liberation and love and life and freedom and inclusion to the workplace. So it's kind of a, it's been quite an interesting journey, Mike. And uh, a few years ago, somebody interviewed me for a book and they said, I'm interested in this notion of you how you reconcile inclusion in the workplace and inclusion in the, in your spiritual community. And I said, well, the thing about teaching inclusion in the church is the message that you have to offer to people in the inclusion, inclusion work in the church is this, is that um, inclusion has nothing to do with performance and morality. And what you have to teach inclusion in the workplace has everything to do with performance and morale. And actually, there's an interesting connection between, on the one hand, we've understood a message that's been very contractual and, and a very an exchange of saying, you know, if you do this, you'll get that. But actually, that's not what it is at all. So uh, I'd be really in, in, in excited to talk to you about this conversation, because, again, Mike, you know that I've got this frame in my mind about the way that the scripture is, is, is based on this whole idea of the child, the young man and the father. And I think that there are different levels of knowing and different levels of understanding around this forgiveness conversation. So so with that rather protracted introduction, thrilled to be here in, in cold London, which is not as cold as Canada. So I, 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 I give thanks for that. <laughs> I think we uh, this morning it was minus eighteen when I woke up. <laughs> oh, that's a balmy under. That's a balmy day's weather in for you in January. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I th I think your uh, the young man child young man father uh, imagery has really impacted me, and I've I've taught from that perspective for a long time. In fact, uh, Hope Fellowship, the church I pastor, the logo is based on that. The oh, seed, no. the sapling, and the tree. And that's, that's oh, our logo. Good. Good. And so it's not going away. No, that's oh. really good. I'm pleased to hear that. Because I think it's such an interesting perspective, Mike, because I think that um, for those of us who, you know, have been privileged enough to be parents, I think we see the world in a very different, for the different lens when you see the world as a father or as mm. a mother, or as a parent or as a carer or whatever else it might be. And I think that's really interesting. And so, um, and, and, and so I'm keen to see the, to, to rethink the, the, the way we look at scripture through that lens as well. 
So in our topic of forgiveness, um, what I'm asking our, our panelists or those that are participating, what are you seeing as a great hindrance uh, why people can't forgive? Um, because again, different stages at child level, you, you're, you almost want to stay angry. You don't want to forgive, or you have these rules set around what forgiveness is or isn't. And then there's a wrestling stage, but in this conference, we've already talked about the idea of, wait a minute, that's our DNA. It's a natural life. We walk in this mode of forgiveness, but not everybody, especially child, child level is not going to get that because no way, I, there's no way that's possible. In your journey, what are you seeing as, as in, uh, either a theme about forgiveness that you're seeing that's really cool or a hindrance? And then hopefully by the end, we can talk about uh, some wisdom uh, on the topic. Um, so, so, so I guess I may, I may come at this from a slightly different. Please do. I expected no less. <laughs> so I hope that's going to be all right. You might, you might decide to cancel the recording. For that, so. No way. No, it's too much fun. But I think for me, uh, Mike, I, I think I want to say that actually potentially the biggest hindrance to me understanding forgiveness is the relationship I have with God and the Bible. And I and I really have a, I've really been thinking quite a lot about that recently. And I think one of the things that I'm coming to see is that if we want to talk about forgiveness, then I think it would probably be as good a place as any for us to start thinking about what we mean when we talk about repentance. And I think that maybe that's not such a bad idea because I think that let's I, go for it. Definitely, I think it's a great track. When, when I when I was when I was a child, if I can use that spiritual language, I was brought up in a very binary uh, Christian environment. And that binary environment was essentially saying to me, um, there's good and there's evil, there's in, there's out, there's, you know, there's inside, outside, there's winners and losers, there's heaven and hell, there's up and down. And that kind of made perfect sense to me. And I read the scripture in a very binary way. And I understood that. And I understood there was something it seemed to be telling me around the notion of saying that actually, um, you know, my theology, my Christianity was essentially a kind of behavior modification program. I, I often talk about the idea of in my early formative Christian years, Christianity was like a sin management system, if you, if you, if you like. And, and I was super clear about that. I understood that. Um, but then I began to understand something actually was, was, was wrong with that paradigm. And so what I was thinking about, if I think about my early formative years, I was thinking very clearly in my mind about repentance. I was raised as a Pentecostal, as many of us were. And in that Pentecostal paradigm, then I was, yeah, I was very clear about what that, what the ask and the requirement of me was. And that requirement was, was of me very much to repent. And what I had thought initially was that repentance was a, a modification of my behavior. And I could, that kind of made sense to me that I was a bad person, then I got saved, now I'm a good person. And so I just needed to kind of keep up these behaviors. So that was okay. And I could see the forgiveness piece was in there somewhere. Um, and I, I'll, I'll come back on forgiveness if I may. I think what's happened over time, Mike, is a, a reframing in my mind of what repentance might mean. So I went from repentance being about a behavior modification and then from having a narrative that essentially was saying to myself, OK, this really is about saying, how do you um, that your, your the sanctification that would drive that repentance would be this progressive rectification of your behavior to beginning to understand, no, no, that's not what this gospel is about. This gospel is actually about a progressive recognition of your identity. So if you move from the notion of saying that it's about reforming your behavior and then you move to a space, it says, no, no, it's about recognizing your identity and you start to pull on that thread, then that takes you into a very interesting place because it takes you into a place of ultimately of union, of oneness. And you come into this very interesting space. And I think this, the ground that I feel like I'm standing on at the moment is now coming back and thinking again about Let's talk about this repentance thing again. And, and for me now, it looks like it's something else. And it looks to me like it's more about this idea of, of, of going beyond the conscious mind. So when you're talking about repentance, it's not just simply changing your mind. I think it's more to do with going beyond your mind. Mm. And, and if, if I may say so, I think it's about 
become getting out of your mind. <laughs> and, and, and I'm really hopeful of the idea of, um, of an out of my mind spirituality. And, and, and that kind of makes some sense to me because in my mind, I have this very binary world mm -hmm. of good and evil, up and down and so forth. So, so I think, Mike, if I, if I start from the position that says, if I'm to get out of my mind, into what mind am I to escape? And I think I'm escaping into a non-dual mind, a mind of the knowingness of the heart. Mm. And I think in that space, what I'm seeing in that space is I'm seeing that I'm entering into the mind of Christ. And the thing about the mind of Christ is, the mind of Christ doesn't have a transactional forgiven, unforgiven frame um, because the mind of Christ doesn't trade in forgiveness. <laughs> uh, and, and in actual fact, it comes, as, it comes as a bit of a thud for some people to recognize God is never going to forgive you. God is never going to forgive you, no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you pray, no matter how what you give up, no matter how righteous you want, self-righteous you become. And you say, what do you mean God's not going to forgive you? That's the entire basis of the scripture. No, no, God's not going to forgive you because there's nothing to forgive. Boom. <laughs> so, oh, <come laughs> on. Well, what is there for me to forgive? Don't you even see in Romans where there is no law, there's no transgression. There's nothing, there's no, there is nothing to forgive. Forgiveness is a construction that has been put into place by a binary legal mind. Anyway, I'll come to that in a minute if I may. So it's interesting that when I see the ministry of Jesus, what I find really interesting about Jesus' ministry, Mike, is that when I, I look at, and, and, and by the way, I think there's so much to say about that, and this is about forgiveness, but I think that you I can rabbit trail. To, you have permission. I can thank you. Um, what I would love our, our, our folks in the conference to, to think about is that um, what's really exciting when you go beyond the mind is essentially this, is that it's not so much, <laughs> don't think about referring to Jesus Christ in the, in the sense people sometimes say Christ isn't Jesus' surname, which is a nice way of thinking about it. But the more important way of thinking about it is this, is that Jesus became the Christ. Because the Christ is the spirit, the Christ is the, is, is the love mind, and Jesus becomes the love mind. Jesus mm -hmm. becomes that love mind, that all expansive uh, uh, forgiveness isn't a paradigm mind. So when he begins to, to minister, it's interesting, Mike, that in, I think it's Matthew 4, you hear this lovely introduction to Jesus, and it says, his ministry begins with, in this land, it says something along the lines, in the land of Zebulon, which of course you know means the land of the dwelling the land of the habitation near the land of naphtali which means the place of my wrestling the way beyond the sea beyond the, the sea of galilee it says and here's what it says the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light and, and it says and those dwelling in the in their region uh in the under what does it say the shadow of death Upon them a great light has dawned. And Jesus walks into that environment and says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it's like, it, it feels in my church brain, I know exactly what that means. That's an altar call, that's come to Jesus, that's, you know, give up your, burn your records, it's all of that. But it's not that he's saying, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. He's saying, get out of your mind, because the kingdom of heaven is within you. And I, and I just think Mike, that when I kind of got there, then I kind of ended up with all sorts of different problems because now I've got all this stuff that I've kind of grown up with and loved and all these teachings that I like, like and all these sermon illustrations that I like. But actually when I strip it right away, I can see something interesting happening. I can see that forgiveness now seems to me to have a very different bent. And I think there is a level at which um, the, the, the people that are dwelling in darkness are called into this light. And I think there is something almost preparatory about this message of forgiveness. And I think if it, what its preparatory value might be, Mike, is it might be that there is something about this message of forgiveness that is not really about anything to do with getting forgiveness from God. That's nothing to do with that. It's actually about 
being healed from the psychic damage that unforgiveness has caused your own unforgiveness and your mm-hmm. own guilt and your, has caused you in order that you might be able to free your mind to enter into the larger mind which is the mind of christ but we're kind of trapped in this prison of of of, 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 of unforgiveness and, and and it's and it's really interesting because i think that as i as i look at scripture and think about how these stories work and think about this whole kind of gospel of liberation that that we've got it does feel to me that jesus is trying to um it's almost like we have to have our we almost have to have our own mind healed of the need to be forgiven in order to live as forgiven people uh, one of your phrases that you 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 i always remember remember i always attribute to you whether it's yours or not i don't know but i love it because it's a nice phrase and i always quote you for it and that's the idea of learning to live loved. That's and, Paul Young. That's Paul Young. It's a beautiful quotation and, 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 and kudos to Paul Young. But the whole point about that is it means learning to live without the need for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Well, even this conference title, the full title is Healing Life's Hurts Through Understanding Forgiveness. And it's a, it's a great point. There is no way, Mike, that you can... There's no way you can be healed of your past hurts. No way until you understand forgiveness. That's just, that's therapeutically impossible. I remember in the, in the first series that I taught, I think I taught three times. It's like a 13 part series, three times. Yeah. Half the time people are saying, oh, this is brand new. I'm thinking, no, it's not. <laughs> but I, I began uh, with the, the confirmation that forgiveness vertically is so done. It's finished. We don't need to worry about the vertical forgiveness. We are already forgiven. If that groundwork isn't set, then now you're scrambling trying to get that in place. Right? So this is kind of what I'm hearing you say. Well, and I kind of want to even, I want to wonder if we might venture even further, which is maybe to ask the question. It's not that the forgiveness is done. There never was anything to <laughs> sure get more real. <laughs> you know what I'm saying though, because I yes. think on the one hand you can go, oh, forgiveness is done. That's okay. great. <clears throat> forgiveness for what? Yeah. But that's asking questions that we're not, we're not, we were never allowed to ask. Like if you've if you've been in church your whole life, some of the, some people are going to hear this for the first time. And go, what is this? And just turn it off because it's heresy. They, they're just going to. But there are others who are on the journey who have already been teased with grace and more grace and more grace. There's something that's going to draw them into hearing this because I think where you're going is exactly the point of all this, a deeper spiritual awareness that we live from spirit. Um, I think you use Jesus as us in, in many times. You know, yeah. that, that was hard phraseology for me, but I get it, you know? So even what you just said, that term is it, beautiful. I think it's, it's, porting us or awakening us to something that's already there we just can't see it well i I think that's right and and it's interesting you say that because i mean that's the whole point right is that when you think about pointing us to something but you just can't see it what you're describing is revelation revelation isn't showing you something that wasn't there it's Mm -hmm. showing you something you didn't know was there and and and, and i think there is I, i think that that feels to me to be kind of an important line of inquiry, Mike, that we've got, we've got to be prepared to go down, to be honest with you. I think we've got to, are we, are we prepared to, to open up the, 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 the door to that? And I, I, I say yes, because mm-hmm. I, think it, I think it's really very, very important indeed. I agree. I'm there. Where do you want to go with this? Because I, I, I can hear people wondering about what about, what about, what about, what about this verse? What about that verse? What about end of the Lord's prayer? It says, you know, God won't forgive you unless you, you know, forgive others. And all those, those, what I call hooks that keep them bound back or chains, uh, preventing people from ex- really growing and understanding what forgiveness really is that, Hey, it's, it, it's, it's what we're now talking about, but all these distractions are in the way and they're real. People still have to deal with them. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And, and, and I think there is something um, profoundly disturbing about um, growing in grace. I don't find anything comforting about that because I find <laughs> the whole thing entirely unraveling and I'm okay with that. But, but let's, let's, let's go back a minute and let's, let's, let's talk about the idea of 
sin and mm. say, okay because you you, you you can't have a conversation about forgiveness unless you can have a conversation about sin, right? That doesn't make sense. So what are we talking about when we're talking about sin? Well, it's interesting that when Jesus comes, he said, John says, behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Now, it's worth remembering that when the moment you and I hear sin we're programmed to think oh you must mean that you know the dirty you know dirty dozen the you know the naughty nine or whatever it might be but actually that's not what jesus says when jesus talks about sin he comes and he comes right very strong about this and he says no no let me explain to you when the spirit comes so let's just do this properly this is john 16 when now i'm saying that jesus and, and and again maybe this is where we need to kind of rewind the whole thing and reset the whole thing i was taught that the whole purpose of this christian life of mine was it was about me getting out of this body and into heaven mm. and that was and it was a zero-sum game it was heaven or hell i had some the grew up as a catholic so there was a kind of middle ground <laughs> which you could have a purgatory and maybe someone could pay you out of there or whatever else it might be but basically that's what i understood but the idea was that you wanted to get out of this body and you wanted to get into heaven and put on your heavenly body that's what i was taught well i don't know because it seems to me that maybe the answer is not that at all maybe the thing that's going on mike is that god wanted to get out of his heavenly body and get into your body mm. Maybe it wasn't that the, the, the Christ was trying to want you to escape your humanity. Maybe he wants to his divinity to escape into you. So it's an in, invasion. There you go, right? That's the point. And maybe when we're looking at it, we might want to look at it again and say, actually, let's just go back. Let's track back to the Jesus story a minute. Because and I'm going to say this, sin is missing the mark. So let's hold on to that. Sure. I'm going to say that's not, I'm going to say that's not a behavioral code. Okay, so that's the point I'm going to make for you. Mm -hmm. So what I'm wondering is, when I look at Jesus, I see this moment in the baptism where he becomes the Christ, where he is infused. And I'm wondering to myself whether this kind of hypostatic union where you have the Christ who is fully God and fully man isn't in actual fact the picture of the Christian life. Mm -hmm. It's Is it not a metaphor for the Christian life? Whereas actually what we're saying is that the... We know this from all the teaching we've had from, from the Apostle Paul. This is the mystery hidden since the ages. What is it? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, it's no longer I that live. Well, who lives then, Paul? It's Christ that lives within me. Uh, I'm crucified with Christ. For me to live is Christ. I mean, I could go on with this stuff forever. But what is that actually saying? It's not saying that Mike Zenka is taken out of there and lifted up into heaven and you spend the rest of your life on a cloud, you know, playing a harp. What it's saying is, that the Christ life has been awakened in you because there is this latency, there is this latency of Christ in you. And what happened depicted in the metaphor of the baptism is that the Christ entered into, the, entered into Jesus. Mm. And when the Christ entered into Jesus, Jesus became the Christ. And let me say to you, as the Christ is awakened in Mike Zenker and Paul Anderson Walsh, you become the Christ in your form. Right. And the and the the in the same way that we hear in Matthew's gospel about this light speaking into the darkness, we hear the same thing in Genesis that the that the the the, the spirit is brooding over the darkness and the chaos and then suddenly it says, Let there be light, and the light <laughs> comes forth. And in the same way, Jesus goes into these into these people who are wrestling in their mind, which you see in that as a metaphor for those states, and says, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the kingdom of heaven isn't somewhere out there, the kingdom is in here, it's inside of you. And so I think that we might want to go back and say to ourselves, well, what do we mean by sin? What do we mean by sin missing the mark? Well, what does it mean to miss the mark? It doesn't mean not to score enough on your grade, to get graded properly on your Christian exam paper. To miss the mark means to live as though you weren't Christ. Bingo. Yep. <laughs> not seeing yourself as Christ sees you or as God sees you. Like just. And that's the whole point. It's not right? the moral infraction. Exactly right. And the reason I think that becomes so complicated for us Mike, is because of this whole business that we've been caught mm. up in, in, for, um, in forgiveness and sin and unforgiveness. And so what, what, what do we see happen if we, if we wind it all the way back? And, and a couple of things. I mean, I think there is quite a lot to be said about whether or not we are courageous enough to <laughs> let's do it this way. <laughs> if you're going to understand this conversation, let me say this to you. 
you will never be un, you will never be able to understand God through the lens of the Bible. That will never happen. What you have to do is you have to understand the Bible through the lens of God. You have to flip it because if and God is love. And so you the only way and, and by the way, can I just remind you, love keeps no record of wrong. Who knew, right? I, I mean, you don't don't get me started on 1 Corinthians 13, but the point about it is you need to start from the position that love chooses not to remember it's not that god it's not that it's not that god forgets he chooses not to remember and, and there's nothing to forgive that, that's not the point we've missed that we talk about being forgiven and jesus is saying no 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 it's not about being forgiven you are not forgiven you are forgiving it's about you being the given it's the forget all this balancing the books nonsense. That, that's not nothing to do with it. You'll see what happens if you're a prodigal son, you're spending your money and you live on desolate living. That's all right, no problem. Um, as soon as you come turning around, there's the father with his arms wide open. Every story in scripture is going to tell you that. Don't, don't get, you need to get out of that. You need to get your head in the game. And your, when your head's in the game, it realizes that to miss the mark means this. It means literally to live as though you were the cause of your own effect, to live as though for you to live is to live like Christ, to live as though you're living by a moral code. Paul, when he figured it out, said, oh my God, I cannot believe this in Philippians 3. Uh, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised on the eighth day as to the law of zealous. But let me tell you what, I realized, oh my God, he said, um, I was perfect unto righteousness. And he said, but do you know what? That which I once thought gain." I consider as lost for the sake of knowing Christ. And where does he know Christ? He knows Christ in him. He knows Christ mm -hmm. as him. It, it, it's a, so it's a different game. So, so, so I think, Mike, I think that the problem is that we've, we've got ourselves, um, we've taken a book that is designed to point us to the one who is our life, and we've made it a rule book mm -hmm. that teaches us how to live our life. And I think we're trapped in that. And I think in that paradigm where we're trapped in this moral surface code, we can't escape into the mystery of oneness. And so we are so completely uh, at a loss with this whole thing that we can't enter into the, to the divine awakening. And it would mean that for me to really own that, I'd have to be able to accept, am I open to the idea that there that the scripture could is not literal in the sense that we've been taught that there are elements of myth there are elements of metaphor there is story there is aphorism there is um allegory there is uh, it, it's a it's a it's a storytelling device that is designed and written in such a way particularly the jesus stories to 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 um to provoke you into consciousness it's a it's a very different book. So so for me, Mike, I guess the yeah, yeah. Ralph Waldo Emerson used to say this when he'd met someone that he hadn't seen for a long time. He was he used to say, What has become clear to you since we last met? And and I think what's become clear to me since I last you and I last met was nothing that I has been taught is clear to me anymore because it <laughs> because it just doesn't make any sense. I, I could say that to you right now. Because we haven't talked for years, yes, and time, absolutely, and to hear what you're sharing now is like so exciting because it's like I am resonating, I am tracking with you. It's like Brad Jerzak said, the word of you know, uh, the word of God uh, grew, and uh, when he was 18 years old, he he grew a beard. You know, the word of God is a person's Jesus, not yeah. the Bible, and, and it's, it's beautiful. I love and, Brad. and all that and all that unpacking, that deconstruction of things that were never true anyway and discovering the framework that's been true, Jesus in us. I remember you were saying once, I forget who you're talking about, but I'll just use, use the example. But it's like, here comes Jesus Christ dressed up like Paul Anderson Walsh. I, I will never forget that. That clicked for me. <laughs> but that is it, right? That, that, is, that is the point, it seems to me. And I think that the incredibly exciting thing that we've never really dared to consider is that we have owned and people have argued about the hypostatic union and that's the idea of is it 
conceivable that the one who was fully God could become fully man and live in that perfect tension. And I would say that what Paul is saying in Philippians is he's saying, um, <laughs> he who was never anything less than God became nothing less than man in order that you and I who thought we were nothing more than men would realize that we're nothing less than God. <laughs> And the idea of the possibility that says, and before people start screaming at you and sending you bad emails, Jesus himself said, quoting the psalmist, ye are gods, all of you sons of the most high. The psalmist said it and the Christ himself said it because he knew that actually what it means to be fully human is to be fully divine, is to be infused with the, div with the divine. And, and for me, that conversation is the conversation I really want to have. What it looks like, Mike, when I escape my mind, when I escape my binary, uh, I'm forgiven, I'm unforgiven mind, and I escape into this realm of which is beyond the logic of forgiveness. When I move, if you like, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and I, I, I'm I'm able just to rest under the branches or indeed grow on the branches of the tree of life. And that Christ life that is in me, that is embodied in me, that is empowered in me, that is this beautiful kind of engaged, fully embodied spirituality. And the only thing I have to do and the only relationship I have with forgiveness is to call everybody to recognize that. <laughs> well, that's going to change everything. It's going to change your lens towards those who've hurt you, which is a big deal for some. Because uh, there are people stuck in a darkness in their own mind right now. And I think okay. you're, you're speaking directly to that darkness with light, like screaming bright light. That's what I'm hearing. Well, bless you, because it, it's, it's, no, it's no surprise, is it, when you think about, you know, two simple stories where you take the story of, 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 um, of uh, Jonah and Jonah's infuriation with the Lord and says to him, I knew I didn't want to come to Nineveh because I knew what you would do. You would tell you <laughs> dreadful people they're forgiven and nobody's paid up. And I don't understand that. And then what do you hear coming from the very voice, the very mouth of the Lord? And this is a really important thing to say, Mike. The last words that come from the Christ's mouth are what? Forgive them, Father. And, and, and can I, dare, dare I say this to you? Um, when he said, forgive them, Father, he didn't say, Apart from Judas, apart from the guy <laughs> next to me on the left-hand side, apart from Pilate, oh, and apart from the guy who was mean to me in the supermarket, he said, forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. And he said to Jonah, what do you want me to do? There are 120,000 people that don't know their left hand from their right hand. You want me to withhold my love from these people? And what do you think this gospel of ours is all about? Mike, church, beloved people of those who, are, who believe that we are followers of Jesus, what do you want me to do? These people don't know their left hand from their right hand. Yeah. I, I love how Jesus called out um, not just some of his disciples, but the leaders, the Christian leader, or Christian, the religious Jewish leaders, when they were calling on Old Testament stuff, and he's saying, no one has seen the Father. Nobody, not a single one, none of them got it right. Nobody. And so we have a progressive revelation coming, and it, it's supposed to go backwards from Jesus. We begin with Jesus, that then look back, and we can see all the incomplete descriptions of and the miswritings of who God was, because they didn't get it right. They saw glimmers of right, but it wasn't all right. And yet no, we use it, that dogmatically. It really wasn't all right. And, 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 I, and I think that the thing is that, that we don't know what kind of a teacher Jesus was either. I think that's such a problem for us, because... Um, you know, he doesn't teach in the in the, in the manner of a of a kind of church pastor or whatever else. This is somebody who is his only interest is pulling you through into the mystery of consciousness. That's all he's interested in. And and when you live in consciousness, Mike, you you kind of um, I don't know. There is a there is a different level of energy that's applied to that. Um, and, and and candidly, I mean, look, I, I don't know if I could even go back to this conversation, but, 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 but if I did go back to the conversation was thinking about the whole idea of forgiveness and unforgiveness. The one thing is for sure is that there is nothing to be dealt with on the vertical line, right? That's obvious that yep. um, 
the fact of the matter is, and it's so interesting that even if you think about Eden and the conversation at Eden, the really important thing is that when we fell into unconsciousness, or more importantly, self-consciousness, mm-hmm. what that allegory and that metaphor is really about is, is about saying the moment you fall into self-consciousness, what happens is this. Sin, if we'll use the stay with the language that we all understand, sin didn't change God's mind about you. Mm-hmm. It changed your mind about God. Mm-hmm. Because he still came and said, Adam, <laughs> where are you? Yeah, it's not like he didn't know he comes into the garden and he knows this stuff right and it's adam that takes the view adam projects his new sound found bias and prejudgment and prejudice and stereotyping and all that stuff he previously now he now projects on god and and what does he do he he covers up he hides he lies he does all that stuff and i think that it's it's so important that we understand that that our sin never change God's mind about us, Mm. irreparably change our mind about him. And because of that, we are live in tyranny and fear of rejection. And we are grasping for acceptance. And we are caught in this insane paradigm of forgiveness and unforgiveness he loves me loves me not he loves me loves me not you know like the children play with a little Mm -hmm. and um but isn't that repentance then isn't that where repentance is is the changing what you saw and believed well wait a minute i'm gonna believe the light of, of what god's telling me about myself yeah i think yeah no absolutely i mean i think that the repentance for me was a uh I, I would I would describe it in this way. I mean, I've, I've, I'll style it slightly differently for you, but I it was a really a, a kind of um, a turning around in the seat of my consciousness mm. that I thought God was like this, but God's not like that. And 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 I think that it is it's a very interesting uh, it's very interesting when you look at somebody, uh, Mike, and you think about what is the difference in a person that is living for forgiveness versus someone who's living from forgiveness. Only different. You know, what is the difference that between someone who's living huh. in order to be loved as opposed to living from the fact that they are loved? Living loved. One who's living for acceptance, <laughs> one who's living from acceptance. The, the, the drivers are so, are so profound. And it's interesting because I think the, the thing that was the accusation that was leveled against people in our community uh, many years ago was that the moment you teach grace, people won't do anything. Well, okay. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute, but let's, let me just remind you of something. It says that, um, in Isaiah, it says, um, even the youths will, will stumble and fall. What does it say? Uh, your, you, you, they will stumble and fall and they will get weary and so on. But what it says in Isaiah, forgive me, not quoting it precisely, but you you you, this is on, or no, the, the, the verse, it says, but those who, wait upon the lord Uh, and that that word is an interesting word it means those who exchange their consciousness Mm. for the lord's that i exchange my sin sin and sin consciousness for his love and loving consciousness those who do that they will run and they will not grow weary (laughs) they will walk and they will not faint and the beautiful beautiful truth mike is that when i come into him and him consciousness instead of sin and sin consciousness i am released into such a radically different amazingly exciting world because suddenly now i appear in the world as the forgiven as the forgiver and i appear as christ as the benevolent selfless loving self in the world and i am able to come to you mike and come to anybody else not you you and I are friends, but people who are not that way with me and say, I come in peace. Hmm. Shalom. I come in peace. It's almost like we're not supposed to know anybody else after the flesh anymore. <laughs> there, there'd be an idea, right? <laughs> but you know, that like that begins, you can't know anybody else after the flesh until you know yourself after the flesh. Yeah, that's a good point. Can I ask you a dangerous question? I don't know if you don't want to answer, you don't have to, but you mentioned earlier, you know, in Paul was saying we are gods in, in the way he worded it. Um, 
there is a tangent of people running down with terminology that says we are God and they're implying an independence as a source. And I don't believe that's, I think that's overrunning the base. Have you heard anything like that? Or how would you address that for somebody saying, well, I am God. You know, it's um, like, oh, uh. I would say that um, if imagine, imagine taking the biggest bucket that you can find, right. And, uh, <laughs> and scooping it into the ocean, you could say that you are, but a drop in the ocean, but mm. you're also the ocean in one drop. Mm. So I think that the, yeah. the, the thing to remember about that conversation is to say that I am God, interestingly, is to, sp is to believe in separation. <laughs> you didn't say because you're oh, oh, that's good. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a dualistic point. Yeah. So I can say that I am God, sir, and I don't simply mean that from, from a, his possession, which is also true, but I am, let me read the quote for you, I'm bone of his bone, Mike, mm. I'm flesh of his flesh, I'm mind of his mind, um, and I am him in my form. Um, I'm not him independent of him. I am as him. Union. I'm in union with him, as are you. Mm -hmm. And, and, the, 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 and the person that we have trouble forgiving. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's, that's, that's exactly right. And I think, you know, I don't know where your conference will take you, but I think that notion of, of thinking about um, that extraordinary thought that we can forgive those who have hurt us is interestingly, the key to our healing is forgiving those who've hurt us. It's the key to our own liberation. Because the truth is that when I hold you in, in unforgiveness, I'm the prisoner. Yep. I'm the prisoner. And it, it's, it's, pain, it's painful stuff. But my, I, I'm, I'm super excited that you're having this conversation. I know some of the people you've got on this on, at the conference this year, and you've got people that are way in advance of me around this conversation. But, but, I, yep. but, I, but I think the real, the real key for me is about saying, if I could say anything in terms of, what I'd love people to take away from this would be to mm -hmm. say the most important thing for you to recognize is that you will never understand God through the lens of your catechism taught Bible. That's you're never going to understand it. The only way for you to do that is to understand God, God through the, the Bible, through the lens of your God. And, and it's the, it's the point that Brad made and, and Brad and I were together in, in Canada a couple of years ago. And I love the time I have with him. And, and the, the thing is there is that the, the real issue is that in the beginning was the word. It doesn't say in the beginning was the Bible. It says in the beginning was the Logos, the word. And that light is the light that lightens, lightens all men. So I think I would say, number one, be very clear about that. Number two, recognize the fact that you are never going to be forgiven. And you might just need to sit with that for a moment. And I know you think, oh, no, I know that's because I've committed the unforgivable sin. No, you're never going to be forgiven because there's nothing to forgive. That's, you can't pay a debt you don't owe. That's, just, it's, just not, it's just not a thing. And that if you want to come again and think again about this whole repentance thing, repentance is not a modification of your behavior. It's a liberation. It's a, 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 a as I've said to you, it's about uh, escaping, if you will, into the larger mind. And it's, it's that simple and that profound that it is about that new mind, that notion of thinking about when you talk about, you know, metanoia, the new consciousness. And, mm. and that is, I think, the Christ mind. I love it. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. Thanks for taking the time for this. I deeply appreciate it. It's an absolute pleasure. Anytime. Oh my goodness. Oh my, 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 I, I have not listened to that for a long time. And to hear the, the words of Paul again, Paul Anderson Walsh, that is, uh, it blew me away. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to invite you to share this like crazy. It is so good. I want to highlight a couple of things that were really, really cool. Um, 
uh, and uh, I'll try and create a meme for this and give credit to Paul, but here's a quote that he we kind of talked about. I got to look this up at the 24 minute mark on my thing, but I don't know where it is in, in the in the actual recording. Um, he talks about it isn't about getting forgiveness, but rather healing from our unforgiveness mind, which is interesting. I want to I want to go back and hear that quote again. Um, and then he also mentioned there's no way you can be healed until you understand forgiveness think about that um we're living if you're living for forgiveness um you're gonna have a problem but we're called to live from forgiveness so living for forgiveness versus living from forgiveness uh, a thing to ponder um i love what he said at the end there you'll never be forgiven because there's nothing to forgive oh my again if if the those uh, phrases are throwing you off um it it likely means you've not sat down long enough to ponder and study this. That's it. Um, that's my hunch. It doesn't mean I, I know something you don't. Uh, I'm saying I see something that you may not see. You see things that I can't see yet. Hence, we have these conversations. I really hoped you liked that. I, I thought that was phenomenal, and I got to go back and, and re-listen to a couple parts because uh, I, I need to rehear what was said and let that really sink into my psyche. And uh, yeah, I loved it. Anyway, I hope you liked it too. Um, let me know in the comments or message me. Um, I thought it was fantastic. So let's uh, come back in 2023. Thank you again for being here with us. Um, I look forward to uh, uh, next year's panel. Um, we're going to have Richard and Bill back and we're going to have other guests jump in on many different topics. So stay tuned. I have a hunch 2023 is going to be quite exciting. And uh, yeah, anyway, for now, have a great rest of the year. Happy New Year. We'll see you in 2023. Join me next time on Still Growing in Grace for more good news. Enjoy previous episodes by downloading our podcast at growingingrace.ca. You can also visit HopeFellowshipYCC.com to find our service times and location. If this show has been an encouragement to you, please consider making a donation today at GrowingInGrace.ca and help us keep spreading this good news. Thank you again for tuning in to Still Growing in Grace.